Today we examine a few books from our rare book collection. Uh, the book collection compared to the rest of the library is rather small, uh, but it contains um, books that are found nowhere else in this country. And we even have a few books in our rare book collection uh, where we believe they're the only copies in the world. We're going to begin with this lovely volume of Charles Burney's um, History of Music. Um, th this is our latest edition. This book was given to us uh, from an estate and it arrived uh, at the archives in very, very poor condition. Fortunately, in uh, Center City, Philadelphia, there is an antiquarian bookbinder. The bookbinder uh, cut the book apart, took the old covers off, uh, and recreated uh, the spine from fragments of the original cover. So the, the book was written by Charles Burney. General History of Music. Uh, this is volume one of four volumes uh, and was published in 1776, which of course is an important day uh, for those of us living in the United States. Uh, Bernie was born in Shrewsbury in Shropshire. He made his way uh, first to uh, Oxford, where he took a bachelor's degree and master's degree in music. Uh, th th where he, he s studied all the classics and he also studied organ. He made his way eventually to London and for years uh, was an organist uh, practicing in, in London. That he came from a, a, a family of some means that, that gave him uh, allowance to travel throughout Europe. And um, he was sort of England's eye and ear on the ground regarding what the music scene was in France and Germany and Italy. His four volume history of music was preceded by two other volumes. One, the present state of music in uh, the Netherlands and Germany, and then another volume, the present state of music in France and Italy. This volume um, concerns uh, itself with the ancient, the, the music of the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks, uh, with a section also devoted to uh, the church modes from uh, the, the Middle Ages. Uh, the four volumes were well received, however, um, the first volume, there was a little doubt uh, uh, about the uh, accuracy of this first volume, and one contemporary of Bernie said that Bernie really didn't know anything about Roman or, or Greek music, but wrote about it anyway. Next, we move to Germany, uh, to Weimar. And uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, Weimar was sort of the center, the cultural center of Europe. Um, Franz Liszt was a resident in Weimar. Goethe was from Weimar. Uh, and so was Johann Gottlob Terpfer. Terpfer was uh, an organist. He was an organ composer. He was a member of the Sicilian Society, uh, which advocated uh, ridding church music from the operatic style that was quite popular at that time. He was a mathematician, and he was also an organ builder. Terpfer wrote several volumes on organ building. Uh, many of which are as relevant today as they were when they were written and published in 1833. We have a, a, a small book of tables. These are logarithmic tables that Terpfer developed uh, to aid the organ builder uh, with scaling of organ pipes. Scaling is the relationship between the diameter of a pipe uh, and its length. And before Terpfer applied logarithmic curves to pipe scaling, the progressions were arithmetic, which meant that occasionally, as one goes up the scale to the keyboard, uh, minor adjustments had to be made to sc uh, in, in the scaling. And uh, there were these abrupt changes uh, that affected the, the uh, tonal quality of the organ. So Terpfer's tables, um, and there, there are dozens of them, are still used by organ builders today. Terpfer 
uh, like his uh, French predecessor, Dom Bedos, uh, in the previous century, also documented the state of organ building in Germany, as Dom Bedos did in France. So here we have uh, one volume of plates, uh, again, much in the style of Dom Bedos. And our volume is open to two pages showing uh, various parts of reed construction and um, also it features um, a novelty of the 19th century and it was very popular and even today some German builders still use this, uh, this style of construction. It's called the um, free reed concept. A free reed um, is not a beating reed in the sense of a, a, a modern trumpet or, or, or posano, but rather if you can imagine uh, a pipe resonator attached to a little device um, much like what one would find in a harmonium or an accordion. So that's a, that's a free reed and uh, this volume has several plates of reed construction, several plates on wind chest construction, and again uh, the material in this volume is as relevant today as it was the day it was published. One of the most unusual genre in our rare book collection is that of organ sermons. During, um, uh, well, uh, uh, from about 1540 uh, with John Knox in, in Scotland, uh, Scotland uh, tossed the Roman Catholic Church out and um, embraced Calvinism. And the Scottish version of Cal Calvinism uh, took a very dim view on um, use of the organ in religious services, while just south of the border in England, the Church of England uh, uh, enthusiastically em embraced the use of the organ. We have here two organ sermons, um, and uh, one, of, one of these organ sermons, beautifully bound in leather uh, in its original binding, is the oldest book we have in our collection, and it was published in London in 1700. So, uh, beginning with John Knox in about 1540, um, there was a, a, a war of words across uh, the, the border with England uh, that lasted well into the 19th century. Here we have a, a published sermon from a Scottish minister uh, condemning the Anglican south of the border for um, using the organ. And here I'm, I'm reading from one page of this. Having, having taken a view of the instrumental music employed in the Jewish tabernacle and temple in praises of God, having seen that this music is inconsistent with the spirituality and simplicity of gospel worship, not authorized by the precepts of, or examples of Christ or his apostles, it will be upon the whole be evident. One, that the worship of the Jewish and Christian dispensations of the grace of God is very different. The worship of the former was of a shadowy, pompous, and temporary nature, and only preparatory to the more pure and spiritual worship of the latter, which is to continue to the end of the world. Two, that Christians should be very careful not to mingle their own inventions with the instituted ordinances of God's worship. Three, after many sufferings and exertions of our ancestors favored by providence were the will worship superstitious and idolatry of the Church of Rome, removed from our land and a plan of reformation carried forward in faith, worship, discipline, and government, which for purity and gospel simplicity was not exceeded and scarcely it is now the duty of every friend of the Church of Scotland to maintain his station, the unity and uniformity of worship in all its purity, and has been and still is authorized and practiced without any addition or alteration. For our next installment of examining our fabulous collection of books and ephemera, we take a trip 
uh, over to Warminster, Pennsylvania. It's about a 30 minute drive from Stoneleigh here. And uh, we uh, walk through our large storage area uh, where we will focus on uh, some of our larger collections um, that are too bulky to house here in Stoneleigh.